Hello, this is our lecture for Friday, February 19th. I'm again recording this from home. Um, thank you for your patience. A couple um, quick updates for you. As of right now, I plan on coming to class on Monday. That could change between now and then, but right now it's the plan. If something does change, I'll let you know. Also, these recordings, I'm putting them on YouTube because I'm having incredible difficulty uploading anything on the campus web from home. I don't know if that's an artifact of my internet here, but I'm having real challenges. So I'm putting it on YouTube. There's a time limitation on YouTube. So these are going to be broken into at least two different parts. So take a look. I'm sure this one will be at least two parts. Make sure that you watch both parts. Similarly, because I'm having these troubles with campus web, the slides aren't posted. Uh, when I get back on campus, I'll try to upload those, but for now, um, they're not posted. I do eventually plan to get those up. Uh, for now, though, just look at these YouTube videos, and hopefully that'll bridge us for a little bit. So our last lecture, we talked about zoo, geography, and bio geography. And today, um, we're going to shift. We're jumping ahead to Chapter 12 in our textbook, which is a taxonomic chapter talking about elephants, hyraxes, and the manatee group. So we're going to keep bouncing back and forth. So we're talking about form and function and then jump into taxonomy and, and back and forth so that we, um, we don't have a bunch of taxonomic lectures in a row. So today we're in chapter 12. Um, so please do take a look in your book for um, chapter 12. If you have an earlier version of your book, then just look for the chapter that has the um, elephants, hyrax, and the manatees. So these are three different orders within class mammalia, and uh, I'll probably just going to refer to them by their common names, and that, sh that should probably suffice for what we're going to be dealing with. Um, these are species that live in both the old world and the new world. These three groups of animals are often grouped together as sort of the super order. And there are some similar characteristics that they have that allows them to be grouped together. Superficially, they look quite a bit different. You have uh, manatees and elephants, which you know, big animals are one's terrestrial, one's an aquatic animal. So they're uh, superficially, they're quite different. And then the hyraxes are this really kind of odd animal that's pretty small at the size of a rabbit, but they, they do have some shared characteristics. So one of those is that they don't have a clavicle or a collarbone. None of these animals have, have that collarbone, which is kind of unique among mammals. They also have short nails. If you look at an elephant's foot, they've got these kind of short stubby nails. Um, same with manatees, same with the hyraxes. So that's kind of unique to this group. There's one exception with one of the manatees that live in the Amazon, but by and large, they all have these short nails. These are all herbivores, and they all have hindgut fermentation, which means they have a cecum. With fermenting animals, you have uh, either foregut fermenters, which are the animals that have a rumen, or you have hindgut fermentation, which are animals that have a cecum. And just a, a quick refresher on what a cecum is. A cecum is this uh, a blind-ended pouch that comes off the intestine. So blind-ended meaning it's just a pouch that doesn't go anywhere. And so it, food and materials go into this pouch. They spend some time in there, go through a fermentation process or a breakdown process through uh, bacteria that live in a symbiotic relationship with the host. And then as the material kind of oozes back out and goes into the intestines, it's in a more digestible state. So we're going to start with order Proboscidea, which are the elephants. And we we skipped the chapter 11 on here because it was dealing with animals that you're really never going to encounter, these little tree shrews. I recognize that most people aren't going to encounter elephants. However, in our culture, we're very familiar with these. So I think it's, it warrants talking about. So uh, Proboscidea, proboscis refers to the long nose or, or trunk that they have. Um, everybody has an idea what an elephant looks like. For 
until recently, elephants were broken into just two different species, the African elephant and the Asian elephant, which look similar. There's a few things that are a little bit different with them. Um, recently, though, through some molecular techniques, it's been determined that the African elephants can actually be broken into two different species. So because of that, we have three different species. We have two species of elephants that live in Africa, the African bush elephant and the African forest elephant. And then we have the Asian elephants. Within the Asian elephants, there's several different subspecies, four different subspecies. These are all elephants that live south of the Himalayan mountains. Um, and uh, th despite there being four subspecies, all four of those subspecies can freely interbreed with each other. So they're considered a species. So with elephants, three different species, two in Africa, one in Asia. Elephants are huge animals. Uh, the African elephant is the largest terrestrial animal. To be able to support an animal that size, they need to have huge home ranges. So these um, both African and Asian elephants have really large home ranges for mammals. These are ecologically important for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of the most important reasons is this because they're an important seed disperser. So they eat a lot of vegetation, they move long distances, and so they're able to deposit seeds all over the place um, in their waste. So you think about island biogeography that we talked a bunch about. These are animals that can move across large patches of habitat and move species around, these plant species through their seeds. So they're really important as a seed disperser, particularly the African elephants uh, moving seeds across large um, sort of inhospitable areas in Africa. These are gregarious, which means they live in groups. Um, gregarious species are with mammals, it's, it's not all that common. Um, elephants are gregarious though. So, um, all three species live in groups. These are animals that mature late in life. So their sexual maturity is um, nine to 12 years old, depending on the species and depending on sort of habitat, habitat conditions at the time. And peak fertility is around 25 to 45. So these are very long lived species. They, uh, they go into estrus about every four years. So most mammals um, are going to estrus. Most animals go into estrus once a year. Elephants only every four years, so that's um, that's a way for them to save some energy. The gestation period is really long; it's about 22 months, so uh, over twice as long as, as humans. So these are animals that are built to live a long time. They mature late in life. They um, have few young throughout their life, uh, but they have fairly high survivorship. There are a few behavioral characteristics that are worth talking about. So the first is something called must. This is essentially the rut for a male elephant. When elephants are in must, they become very uh, aggressive. They fight within each other. They become aggressive to other species as well. Um, just like deer when they go into rut, how they're uh, more aggressive both with fighting other deer and then just being more aggressive with other species. There's a lot more hormones running around in their body. Um, this changes their behavior significantly. Elephants communicate with vocalizations. They, they're they really loud. They have ears um, that are able to pick up sounds from a very long distance. So they're able to use these vocalizations and communicate across large open spaces. Something that's kind of interesting about these as well is their ability to detect what's called infrasound. So they could produce sounds that are at these really low wavelengths that create a vibration. And they're actually able to, to pick up on vibrations through the ground. Um, so they can make noises that produce these vibrations and they can pick it up through the ground. Elephants have sexual dimorphism. Sexual dimorphism is where you have different sizes depending on the sex. For elephants, the males are bigger than females. Um, uh, some mammal species, it's the opposite, but on elephants, males are significantly larger than females. And then we had talked about teeth earlier, and uh, one of the types of teeth were these lophodont teeth, 
Lophodont teeth have these horizontal ridges. Um, they're not crescent shaped, but actually horizontal. Elephants are one of the few species that have these type of teeth, the lophodont teeth. The feet of elephant have some pretty unique adaptation. So this is a, a pretty cool image here on, on your screen. I don't think your textbook has um, one of these images, unfortunately, but um, if you look at the, the foot of an elephant, first you can see these nails. They have these really short, stubby nails on the foot. And then um, within the, the bones of the feet, there's a large pad that provides cushioning. These are animals that weigh several tons. And uh, so they need to have, have cushioning to be able to cushion the joints and to be able to support that large body. And if you look at, at an image of the foot here, you'll see that they, they sort of have their own built-in tennis shoes or sneakers with these cushioning in their, their foot that's um, both cartilage and fat that provides cushioning when they walk and provides cushioning to support that large mass that they have. Elephant skulls are also adapted for the, their large size. Um, an elephant skull is massive. And in order for them to be able to lift that thing up, they need to be able to reduce the weight of the skull. So if you took the skull and cut into it, it's, um, it's full of sinuses and pores. So it, that reduces the weight of the skull and allows them to be able to move that, that huge head around with a little bit less energy and a little less stress on the muscles and the other um, skeletal structures of the body. That creates for a really unique looking skull. And then another thing worth pointing out is if you take a look at the skull and you look at the way that the orbits are on it or the eyes are on it, it looks like there's just one orbit there. Um, there are two orbits, it's just not separated by a septum very well. This is actually the origin of the Cyclops myth. So people encountered these skulls, and it, these are massive skulls that look like they came from giants, and there was just one eye orbit in it. So this led to the, to the myth of the Cyclops.